I think when I was in the eighth grade, that's when I got hip to the Mexican Mafia through my dad and his associates. And they took me to a doping house and they said, we're gonna test you. And they just said, uh, kill him. When we hold him, he's gonna slam, let him go slam. He's gonna sit down on the chair. And uh, when you see him, us get on the side of him and hold his arms, he's not gonna suspect you, you're just a little kid. Jump on his chest with a knife and start whacking him. So I did that, and uh, after that, I think they used me about two or three more times. I just took the initiative and I cut his throat on the yard and basically set an example for everybody out there that if you're gonna run your mouth about the Nazi lowriders, we're gonna try to kill you. Well, I was asked to put somebody down on the yard because he was uh, in the hat, what they call in the hat when they're in trouble with the Aryan Brotherhood. And I went out in the yard and uh, I stabbed him and uh, I actually got away the with The Department it. of Corrections has defined gangs into two distinct entities. The first entity is that of prison gang. A prison gang is any gang that has its origins or roots in the California Department of Corrections or any other correctional system. The second entity is that of disruptive group, which does not have its origins in the prison system and are gangs that most law enforcement officials are accustomed to dealing with, such as Crips, Bloods, Norteños, or Sureños. This is important in understanding the distinction of these two entities for outside law enforcement. As law enforcement officers, we often think that a gang member is a gang member is a gang member, and that's not the case. In dealing with a disruptive group gang member, he has some loyalties to the gang itself, but oftentimes is not willing to die or sacrifice himself or his family for that gang or that organization. Conversely, a prison gang member is willing to give his life is willing to sacrifice his family and everything he has and owns for the purpose of that gang or organization. In the state of California, probably the most well-recognized and most powerful prison gang is known as the Mexican Mafia or La M. The Mexican Mafia formed in Dual Vocational Institute or DVI probably around 1957, 1958 for the purpose of protecting Southern Hispanics from other racial entities. Another prison gang recognized by the California Department of Corrections is known as the Aryan Brotherhood, or AB. The AB was formed in the San Quentin State Prison. It has a tenuous alliance with the Mexican Mafia and has known enemies, uh, the Black Gorilla family and the Nuestra Familia. Another recognized prison gang is that of the Nazi Lowriders, or NLR. Historically, the NLR has been a white prison gang it was actually started in the California Youth Authority, created a lot of problems for us within the prison system, and we're seen as rivals to the Aryan Brotherhood. Uh, we don't see that rivalry so much. As soon as I got here, uh, everything that I had thought about, you know, wanting to be involved with this group, it was intensified. Because now I was in the house of the Brotherhood, which was a brand, and I wanted to be around them, and if they were willing to accept what we as the Nazi lowriders were bringing to the table, and I wanted them to respect us and I would give them their respect. But if they were, their attitude was like I had heard that you know, they didn't have any time for us or they didn't want to pay us our, our respect, then I was gonna actively pursue killing one of them. And shortly after that, we basically brokered a deal with the Aryan Brotherhood to bring the, the Nazi lowriders under their, you know, kind of under, in with them. So basically, it would be one entity. There is a faction of the NLR called the FTB uh, which stands for Fuck the Brand. Um, those are relatively a uh, small number. But the NLR, uh, our understanding at Pelican Bay is that the NLR has adopted a policy of only recruiting and bringing in new members that are not of a mixed race. This perception about the racism, it's not really racism whatsoever. It's like in a battle. I mean, if I line up across from you and you're my enemy in a battle, you're my enemy. The reason that it's considered racism is because it just so happens that the people that we're at war with are other races. When right. you come into the Department of Corrections, automatically the first thing that you're indoctrinated in is you stick with your race and that's it. That's just the California Department of Corrections. That's just the way it is. So I personally have no personal angst towards any minorities. My wife is Mexican and she was my girlfriend when I was a Nazi lowrider. I have no problems against them. The way I looked at it was, if you were a northern Mexican or you were a black, you were my enemy. Not because of your race, but because of the political lines that you've drawn within the Department of Correction. It's all politics. 
So the, the race thing, as far as like, you know, dealing with police officers mm -hmm. or the general public, that's never been an issue. Yeah. Now, make no mistake, there are hardcore white supremacists involved with our movements. There are guys that would like to do away with having members of our groups that are of mixed race because there are Nazi lowriders that are Mexican and white. Um, I think there's even one that's like Filipino and white. And there are people that are members that are trying to get that done away with, you know, saying that, you know what, we're not going to have these people involved with us. But the majority of us believe that it's all about where your heart is. The Nuestra Familia has as enemies the Mexican Mafia and the Aryan Brotherhood and has an alliance with the Black Gorilla family to conduct its business. The Nuestra Raza, or Northern Structure, is also a prison gang. The Nuestra Raza um, could be akin to a AAA farm team for the Nuestra Familia. It has all the same um, belief systems, ideologies, and it's from the Nuestra Raza, or Northern Structure, that the NF uh, recruits its new members. Another organization recognizes a prison gang is that of the Black Gorilla family. It's comprised entirely of black inmates. A lot of people believe that the Black Gorilla family has died out, that it uh, took upon itself a political agenda in the 60s and early 70s, and a lot of people believe that that's died out. However, that's not the case. Uh, the Black Gorilla family is still operating, still recruiting, um, and in many ways is way ahead of the curve um, in regards to the other prison gangs in that it's morphed, uh, changing its name, um, changing some of its methodologies in order to avoid detection by law enforcement. The last prison gang recognized by the California Department of Corrections is the Texas Syndicate. Uh, it was primarily comprised of Hispanic inmates that had migrated to California from Texas. Within the California Department of Corrections, the influence of the Texas Syndicate is very minimal. Um, as a gang investigator at Pelican Bay, I wouldn't expect that uh, very many law enforcement officials on the streets of California would have much contact with them as they're a very small entity. Not every street gang member uh, would qualify to become a prison gang member. The prison gangs, because of the type of criminal activity that they engage in and because of the way the organizations are structured, only recruit the cream of the crop. Um, I like to think of it in terms of baseball. You have your street gang guy that the law enforcement officer is going to deal with on the streets, and I would equate him to being a single-A ball player. Now that single-A ball player, once he's convicted in a court and sent to the prisons, operates on a whole different level and a whole different uh, field of play with a different caliber of gang member. And I would equate those guys on our maximum security yards to uh, double-A ball players. The next level would be the guys who act as the inter intermediaries between the guys on those level four yards and the prison gang members, and those would be your AAA ball club guys. Those guys are your prison gang associates. Those are the ones that are being looked at for recruitment to make membership. And then when talking about prison gang members, you're talking about the cream of the crop, the pro ball club. You know, I was like, you know, there's got to be more. This is this shoe life is racking up to 15 years here and it's like you know what this isn't much of a life this is more or less an existence and the people that I'm believing in or the regime that I'm believing in is actually turning out to just to have no actual foundation that they've built their structure on. I started seeing that things that I had held respect for and things that I had actually felt were honorable they they really were nothing but people trying to boost their own egos within the system. There are a bunch of men that were never going home that had life to do, that were trying to use people like me that did have a date to get them money on the streets or to, I mean, they, they, they send somebody out there to kill somebody just so they could tell one of their partners that they had somebody killed out there. You know, like they had some kind of power. And I, I just, it didn't really sit well with me that I was gonna be used as a puppet like that. One thing right now with the Mexican Mafia, they're targeting families now because of us dropping out and disassociating ourselves from the prison gang. My ex-wife just got killed. Uh, from my understanding, Los Angeles authorities down there, they, they pretty much have a feeling who, who it is, right? And I, I pretty much, I, am, I'm, I'm, uh, I know the individual myself, and I'm pretty, pretty much assuming that he did commit the crime, but. And you think you know the particular motive? 
yes. or the reason why he did? Oh yeah, definitely, because he was my Sally, and he was my foot soldier. Uh, his agenda was, he's from the same gang that I was in the streets, but being that he's a youngster, his, he always wanted to be in good standings with me and other members of the Mexican Mafia. So he's gonna go out there and do what he has to do. Why are you talking to law enforcement? I wanna take this opportunity to try to start to make amends for some of the things that I've done against our society. Um, and secondly, is because it really helps me being a parolee, being a felon. If I have things in my file that, that say that I've worked with law enforcement and I've helped you guys, it helps me in the future to get jobs. It shows that I am rehabilitated and I'm not just out there biding my time until I commit another crime. When you come into prison, it's generally just like being drafted into the army. You know, as a white man, you know, there's certain expectations you're gonna have, as in, uh, you know, working out, keeping physically fit, uh, uh, to pass messages to where even if they say, like, there's a sexual predator on the yard and, you, you know, and, and uh, they, you know, you don't get to raise your hand. They tell you to do something it's expected of you to do. Uh, and um, that goes pretty much with anything. You don't have, you don't have your own, you know, uh, you're not your own man. You're, you have to abide by the rules that have been laid down from long before I started doing time. And, uh, you know, and they vary from, from, uh, from prison yard to prison yard, basically, but they're all basically the same rules. That are you know that are that apply to us. They used to not get mad at you or this or that, and there was no repercussions if you couldn't do a stabbing or you couldn't make sharpening or you, you know you didn't want to do that. You know you were just treated as a, as a cast off. But but now it's pretty much it's it's forming into you you have to do things now. It's mandatory. There's more uh, there's more uh, dog eat dog. It's like there's a lot of more bad calls now being done as, as a bad call being like this guy wasn't a rat but by word of mouth you know somebody else that may have had a problem with this guy can say hey that guy's a rat and then boom that dude's took him down and he's not even a rat in his life you know he just you know he's expired you have he's to dead. overcome all the obstacles that are in your way of, of knowing what's going on in each pod you know like I was in a pod there was two other NLRs in there with me and all the other guys were spread out throughout the building so I would have them sign up for the law library when we would go over to the law library, I would get kites from all of them and they would report to me what was going on in their pod. You know, any dealings with the other races, um, if they're having problems with their studies. At the time, I was putting emphasis on all the Nazi lowriders in the building learning Spanish so that if we needed to communicate with each other over the tier, we could speak Spanish. We did this for about a year and a half and we completed our Spanish studies and we all spoke Spanish fluently. So we could speak Spanish the cops wouldn't know what we were saying unless it happened to be a Spanish-speaking police officer. We'll have defense attorneys that re already represented other members, you know, so they got a long history with them, you know what I'm saying? And it's usually these individuals that'll send defense attorneys down there, hey, I need you to go visit so-and-so. I need you to pass them this message. It's usually messages that are being passed, you know what I'm saying? So he'll go down the county or he'll go to another prison and he'll pull that individual out for an attorney visit. Now, CDC cannot deny them that, you know, attorney uh, client privileges so while they're there you know he'll pass whatever information he has going now he may know it's wrong but he's not going to say nothing because he's on a payroll he's being paid okay. you know what i'm saying you know like money talks bullshit walks so he'll pass it i mean it's been known at times where they've you know took drugs to certain people in county you know what i mean or coming up to prison you know where you have contact visits they'll bring things in you know what i mean because you know there are Everybody's dirty, you know. I mean, everybody has a flaw, you know. What I mean, and it's just up to us to find that flaw, you know. Um, if somebody doesn't want to work with us, you know, what I mean, that's where extortion comes in, you know. Um, we'll hire an investigator, you know what I mean. Um, or we try to find out where dude lives, you know. Check where his family's at. Take photos of his kids. Next time he comes up, you know him, you know her. Yeah. Well, this is what we want, you know. Force his hand. You know, he works with us, but most of the time they're bullying, you know, because they got a long history with us. What if know? they want to stop? I mean, they, they have a long history with you, and all of a sudden they, mm -hmm. okay, I don't want to do this anymore. Well, then he's going to have to do what I did, you know, pretty much inform, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, you just can't walk away. You know too much. You know what I mean? You know too much. And to leave you out there with all that information is just a risk. It's a security risk. So more than likely, you know, something will be done to them. You know what I mean? But more than likely, a lot of them don't leave because the money's good. 
How about the court system? Any way to manipulate the court system that your organization does? The court system, we'll use them like to, you know, get from one county to another county, you know, habeas corpuses, um, to get people transferred down that way. Like, you know, I was mentioning to get somebody hit, you know what I mean? Or if we need somebody from another facility to come up, because we need to get at them, talk with them, you know, um, we'd have them subpoenaed or what have you in order to come down, you know, and be able to take care of our business. You know what I'm saying? Um, defense attorneys, you know, I mean, but we also went to the extent of um, trying to intimidate DAs. You know, um, there's been a couple of times where, you know, uh, contracts have been put on DAs. To you make know them not I mean? prosecute. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? So, I mean, we'll do whatever it means in order to help the organization advance. You know what I'm saying? So if it means, you know, intimidating or taking out a DA, yeah, sure, why not? While we were working the Mexican Mafia RICO uh, in Los Angeles, we saw representatives from, you know, dozens of gangs brought together, even though they were warring on the street, Mexican Mafia called them together in parks and ordered them to, uh, to carry out their edicts in the community. And that was something to see. And, in fact, it took me a while to convince many law enforcement officials that such a thing was happening and that taxation uh, policies of the Mexican Mafia were being enforced on the street. Since they don't normally report this kind of thing to the police, uh, we had to show them some law enforcement officials videotape of these meetings and the paying of, of these taxes in order to convince them. So unless you're from like Lowell Street, Opal Street, Matavia, and you're not representing as a Sureño, or tiny rascals, every other Southern California street gang is loyal to the Mexican Mafia. Yes, and in a lot of ways they would be. So they'll put a green light on their neighborhood. The Mexican Mafia will. Yeah, they'll get a few associates from every gang and uh, go to their neighborhood and just start getting off on them, shooting. Then they have to pay to get that green light off them. So, uh, and more or less got everybody loyal down there out of fear. And were they a big influence within your community back when you were a youngster? Yes, yes, they've always been. They've always, uh, you've always had one or two brothers from the neighborhood that basically they run the entire neighborhood. All uh, the, the drug houses, uh, you can't do nothing without them knowing first. If one person's transferring, say going out to court, we'd send him with um, what we call little wheelas, kites, where he'd have them key shirt or he'd swallow. So when he transferred, he'd bring them out hand them over to who he needs to hand them to. Uh, the same way he goes for um, on the streets, somebody paroling. We'd send him with the whole uh, roster of who needs to get hit, um, guidelines, what needs to be done, and he'd carry out those messages. To allow him. a gang member, like such a smart organization, to run something, I mean, that's the biggest thing you could do wrong. You know what I'm saying? From my experience, because now we have control. You know, we, we're gonna say whether you're gonna have a good day or not. You know what I mean? Not you, you know what I mean? you know and allows us to conduct our activities if we get a councilman or whatever to come talk with us that just puts our you know our foot in the door yeah you know what we'll help out the community but now what do we got coming you know what i'm saying you know now once we got that understanding and we're not getting nothing back well then you know what let's let's let the community raise a little hell you know what i'm saying you know basically the same thing but on a larger scale you know so you don't want to do because that. you really don't have no cops around the neighborhoods and everything mm -hmm. you know well like us we would send our organization would send people out there you know and uh you know they'd go out there they you know they put a stop to a lot of the um, violence that's taking place in that neighborhood or say you got a mom and pop store at the corner and you got people kicking back over there a lot of gang bangers and stuff you know well these individuals go there and hey get the hell away from here make it safe for the moms and pop store they get more clientele we make the neighborhoods or communities a little safer for parents and their kids to go out there in the streets and play, right? And doing so because these parents and everything, you know, they see this. They see what this individual or individuals are doing. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, they're gonna be more cordial to them. They're gonna be more accepting of them. You know what I mean? Even though they're committing illegal activities, they may not know of. All they're doing is trying to keep, keep the community safe, right? So that way when law enforcement comes through and wanna ask them questions about this certain individual, well, they're gonna be like, I don't know what you're talking about. You know what I'm saying? You know, because automatically they're going to think, oh, here comes the cop. You know what I mean? What's he want? He coming over here to harass us. You know what I'm saying? And why are we going to give up somebody who's doing something good for the community, for our neighborhood? Once you parole from Pelican Bay or from a prison, from a level four prison, once you become a camarada or a, a soldier or a high level associate, it doesn't matter where you're from. You can walk into any other neighborhood, unless you've got personal beef with that neighborhood. But 
you can walk into any other neighborhood and say, here, I'm, I'm here representing a carnal here, a brother here. It doesn't matter where you're from. If you're there to deliver a message from the Mexican mafia, you'll be respected and you'll be left alone. Because if they mess with you, then there'll be consequences to pay. Yeah, I was a reserve regiment commander for the San Jose area, meaning that anybody paroled into my, to the San Jose area or the Santa Clara County, little cities within there, well, they fell under my jurisdiction, the other fellow that was with me in charge of overseeing it. So we'd educate people, send them out there, uh, whether to be out there to uh, do crime in order to funnel money back, you know, um, send out hits, do murders, what have you. So anything that happened out there that the organization was doing, we was aware of it. Um, we'd have them get into jobs that may open the doors for other parolees getting out there so they can get jobs there. Uh, preferably, we like to get them in jobs where money laundering be feasible, um, such as uh, restaurants, uh, tattoo shops, you know, where you have an endless amount of customers, you know what I'm saying? And it's real easy to just doctor the books and say, well, you know, we had 20 customers come in this day. That's why we have this extra money. And what kind of crimes were they involved in? Uh, they were involved in um, bank robberies, armor, cup, armor car robberies. Um, extortion, money laundering, murder, intimidating witnesses, you know what I'm saying? Um, home invasions, you know, anything that, if there was money to be made, we got our hands in it. Drug deals, um, prostitution, gambling houses. Now that the Nazi lowriders have become, you know, an entity of the brand, the AB now has 3,000 people, most of us aren't doing life sentences, mm -hmm. that they can send out to the street mm -hmm. to carry out their objectives. So as these people start getting paroled, you're gonna be dealing with a higher caliber of individual, somebody that has a goal in his eyes, something that he wants, you know. When I was ready to parole, you know, six months before I decided to drop out, I was dead set on going out to the public and just wreaking havoc. I mean, doing everything I had to do to make money, to institute a, a powerful regime in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. and to let people know that the Nazi lowriders were gonna be a force in California. Fortunately, I came to my senses before I got out, but I know four or five people right off the top of my head that are paroling this year with those objectives in mind. And it's given you something new to deal with out there. I mean, it's not just a, an NLR member getting out now that doesn't have any objectives because before we got involved with the brand, we didn't really send people out there, hey, go do this or go do that. It was just like, hey man, you get out, have fun. They go out there, shoot some dope, um, have party, you know, have some fun, get busted for something petty, and come back to prison. Now, these NLR members are gonna be held accountable for their actions when they parole. You know, they can't just parole anymore, go out there and shoot dope and, and get with some broads, and then come back and be comfortable because they're gonna get killed, they're gonna get hit. You can have a camarada do a hit for you. Like, let's say somebody wants somebody killed in the streets. You can have a, a guy paroling from Pelican Bay this for $5,000, you can have this, this come out, I kill him, and the money goes straight to the brother. It doesn't even go to the guy doing a hit. I've seen that happen a lot. So, murder for hire. Murder for hire happens all the time. Uh, extortion, uh, even dope trafficking, uh, selling weapons. It's and common practice all the time. They, they run together, they, they run together in, in, in prison, and if, let's say, if some guys parole, and uh, Mexican Mafia members parole, or Aaron Brotherhood members parole, and yeah, they get together out there and conduct business. Yeah, it's not uncommon at all. You'd have to exercise at least anywhere from two to three hours. You know what I mean? Um, both physically and mentally. Well, yeah. that exercise, what are you doing? You know, even though they took the weights, we still improvise by using magazines or what have you to make weight, weight bags, you know, um, using each other, bench each other. In a prison setting, it's a hostile setting. You know what I mean? So you always got to be prepared for the unexpected when you least expect it. So, you know, you got to stay in shape for that. You know, because if you're not in shape, you're going to get your ass whipped. You know, or, or even worse, killed. Me and the two other gentlemen that were leading the exercises would be up at 445. We would start our workout routine and be working out from about 515 in the morning until 11 o'clock. By the time we finished, we would eat our breakfast and then we study for the rest of the day. And all this was down, I mean, it was written in a book. I had an actual book of the rules of my building. And people that couldn't follow the rules or they couldn't deal with the routine or they couldn't, you know, they couldn't get up on time, I mean, if you were one minute late for getting up, you would have to do, have a penalty for it. You know, we educate ourselves on, on our culture, which would be Mexican history, Aztec history. How many of you, or people that are watching this video, have ever heard of Carl von Klauswitz? Probably none of you have even heard who he is. He 
modern, he basically revolutionized modern Western warfare. And what he did was he took a philosophy of war that was taking every aspect of warfare into account, planning for every little bit that would come up, considering how you're gonna receive your information, the friction of your troops in route to their enemy, everything that you can come up with. And he put it all into a book and it's basically a philosophy of warfare. And I've studied this book extensively. We also had to learn like rules and regulations of the, of the organization and lower gangs that we had in the households and learn how to make weapons, um, do essays in order to better understand our principles and our objectives in order to uh, instill that into people's minds. So that way when they become participants within it, they're more loyal to it, they're more dedicated to doing it. Did you utilize your training from the Marine Corps throughout your um, gang career? Yes, I did. Did you use your military training to teach Yes, I did. Perspective uh, gang members. I started that when I was just uh, in the regular gang. The philosophy of the Marine Corps, did you, um, Semper Fidelis and stuff like that? Yes. You blend it over into the gangs? It was well? basically like a gun home mentality. Okay. You know, there's some people back there who know how to box. So if they're in the cells together, they teach each other how to box. You know, um, if somebody knew any type of um, martial arts or stuff, you know, they would teach their own people how to do martial arts, you know? So these are things that people carry out there to the streets. You guys watch cops, the show cops, and look for weaknesses either in policy, procedure, um, so that you can break it down and use it to your advantage at a later time when you were in the organization? Those are times, yeah. We'd, you know, we'd observe it and, you know, we'd say, you know, hey, you know, the way he cuffed him up or the way he took him down or whatever, you could have done this, you know, or he could have done that, you know what I'm saying? You know, or um, by the way, me and him were discussing one time, you know, such as getting rid of dope, you know what I'm saying, out of a car, you know what I'm saying? You know, you make certain turns so you can throw it out a certain way and you'd be out of you guys' view, you know what I mean? Certain things, you know, um, how you guys would handcuff people, you know what I mean? I'd watch how cops come up close on people, you know, how they would approach a car, you know, because a lot of them would just go up there, non, you know, just like nothing, you know, hey, roll down your window, you know what I'm saying? Not really knowing that, hey, dude may be up to something, he just may put a bullet in him. You know what I'm saying? Bam. You know what I mean? Or we also focus, like, when you guys stop, okay, he's gonna come out and go, take off. You know what I'm saying? That's your time to take off. You know, so yeah, we look at certain things. You know what I mean? Because, you know, you guys have a, you know, unlike us, you guys have policies and procedures that you guys gotta follow. We don't gotta follow those rules. You know what I'm saying? So we look for those weaknesses within your guys' procedures. Do you guys go as far as doing certain things, like maybe reaching your hand out through a food port to see how the cop's gonna react, maybe setting the cop up, doing certain movements, quick movements, to see if the cop even reacts? Yes. I mean, you guys go that far? Right. To yes. just see how, how we're gonna react, if Texas we react. reaction. Because all, uh, all our tactics are, are built upon your reaction. You know, we do things that provoke an act uh, a reaction from you guys and study it. Did you ever practice in the cell um, if you were handcuffed? Yes. Kicking, jumping yes. through the handcuffs? Yes. And how often would you practice that kind of stuff? Two to three hours a day. Coleman, could you demonstrate how you would uh, defeat a handcuffing procedure by a law enforcement official? Yes. Okay, so if you had your hands up here, right, and you brought one hand down here, and you had you, you try to get this one. Just like that, before before he commits. Before he commits to grabbing your other hand. Exactly. You're the minute he has this one. Mm -hmm. What could a law enforcement official do to uh, defeat what you would intend to do to him? I would have him lay down on the ground and cuff him. If you're doing a felony stop, put the guy on the ground and cuff him up. Cuff him up. Is there anything else? I mean, um, lay down, have him lay down on the ground, put your knee in his back, so that way he couldn't maneuver out of, out of anything have his hands above his head, bring him back, cuff him up like, like you normally do. Because it's hard to move when you're just laid out flat. Especially with the weight of a person on your back. Yeah. But don't well, dig the knee in there. No. <laughs> <laughs> what about balance? I mean, like if they had to spread your legs a little further than what you had there, you're still able to... Yeah. You had your hands up there. I brought one, brought her down. Same thing. Still and balance. If, and if he, if he tries to compensate, like uh, say be kind of standoffish, all I have to do is extend with a fist 
uh, hand with this. Could he have his, his like if he's taking that hand down, your left hand down, could he have his right hand up on your elbow or something? To, the to grace? It, to, yeah. yeah. But how you going to do that and cuff me at the same time? Yeah, of course not. Now you're, now you're in a tussle. How about if your hands were behind your back instead of up on your head, you know? Spread like the legs, spread the legs a little bit further back. And if you put your hands uh, behind your back, you know, like that, the officer reaches out. So you reach out, so you reach out with your uh, left hand and take his right hand. So be, with, with, yeah, across that way to bring right. back and put to so be able to put a cuff one. on that. Yeah, okay. grab grab him by the hand, by the by by the palm of the hand. With, with uh, yeah, down. Yeah, so that's similar. Right. How would now? How, what kind of move do you make from there? Just coming up with the left hand. Mm -hmm. I'll do it. Is there any safe way to to handcuff? Standing up, other than you know, not laying somebody on the ground because you can't lay everybody out all the time. But the the fingers in the lock is difficult. Like it's it's difficult for a person to maneuver, mm -hmm. to you know, to spin. Okay, but uh, the, the safest way w would be to put him on the ground, put some weight on him, so he can't maneuver at all. That just alleviate all all of it. So if you had your fingers in the lock, so like you had them in the lock behind your hand, if you were to grab your fingers and hold your fingers. Um, well, if it's going to go to cuffing at some point, got to unlock. Right, then it's yeah. same opportunity. But while the, while the fingers are interlocked and it has a good grip on the fingers, is it more difficult to move and try anything that way? Have him interlock his fingers? Yeah, if you have, yeah, okay, do it that way. Grab the fingers there, put one hand across and hold the fingers down. If, say just you, like that? Yeah, say you just go into search. That's the best thing you That's can do. That's the best way to do right there. Officer puts handcuffs on you. Is that officer safe at that point? Not all the time because we train to kick. Uh, groin area, legs, uh, learn what angles to kick because uh, the easiest way to break a joint is to go this way, cross it. So like if uh, if I'm cuffed up and let's say the sergeant, I just tell extracting the sergeant right there, I might kick downward in that angle and break his leg just like that. Could you demonstrate what you would do if an officer was to strike you with a baton if you were in, in a combative position? If he was, if he was, if he was to strike me, and come this way. That's right. What I would do, I would go in close because the, the, the full blunt of the blow, the power is at the end of the extension. So I would block it close, go for leverage, hit it down, spin it down. Yeah. Okay. So, so those are the way. kind of things that you're practicing day in and day out in your yes. cell and you're training other, uh, anything else that you worked on practice? Could you also pull them in? Yeah, it's all kind of things you do. Yeah. Well, and other things that we practice is uh, like person stabbing an officer. Okay, like for say you have your vest on, there's soft spots on the vest. So we go for our armpits here, here, and here. Now, the idea is even if you don't have a vest, sometimes the knife gets stuck or whatever. You got these inmate manufacturers, but sometimes they ain't, they ain't uh, strong or, or durable as we expect them to be. So, what we do is any knife you go straight in. When you go straight in, pull straight out. Go straight in, push them off balance, hit them again, straight out, hitting soft target. Like that. So, like that. In the organization that you come from, the BGF, they are, uh, have a reputation for studying anatomy. Yes. What areas on the body are you looking to strike if you're going to strike an officer? Well, you have your bladder, you have your diaphragm, you have your lungs, you have your heart. You have uh, up here some arterial arteries up in here behind your uh, clavicle. And then you have your, your juggler. Then you have your temples. Then you have the back of, uh, it's part of your brain stem and the back of the head. Those would be places I would put, put a knife. And those are things that you studied in the cell. You got anatomy books, yes. looked at them, practice on them. Drew a picture on the wall and, and practice. For hours at a time. Until I got it right. If you're not gonna follow the rules that are set by the academy and what they teach you in the academy, you could pay for it with your life. I mean, here's an example. When I was up here in Oregon, I did something down in Southern California and I had to go on a run. So I came up here to Oregon and I started committing robberies and burglaries. Um, these people have so many guns in their houses up here that it's just crazy. You know, I had an apartment that was full of semi-automatic rifles, handguns, I, it was just full of them. Well. Me and my girlfriend at the time, we had a little dispute and somebody called the police. <clears throat> so automatically I assumed that the police were showing up because I had been doing these robberies and these burglaries. So when I went to the door, I put a 357 in my pants and pulled my shirt over and it was loaded. 
So I, they, they pull me out to the front yard and they're talking to me. And the whole time that I'm talking to them, I got this gun right in my waistband. And I'm thinking, you know what? I could just take these dudes out right now. There were a couple of older guys, you know, they were kind of like uh, hillbillies. And they were paying no attention to what was going on. Then they started asking me questions about me having a dispute with my, my girlfriend. I realized that they weren't there to bust me for the burglaries or anything like that. So I kind of let my guard down. They thought I had been hitting on my old lady because her sister had called the police because we were wrestling. and mm -hmm. It was nothing. So I cleared it up and I was getting ready to go when a detective shows up. They put me in cuffs and they take me down to the station. They didn't search me. I was sitting down at the station cuffed up, sitting in a chair for about four hours. Finally, once I figured out that they were going to end up letting me go, I told one of the cops, hey, man, uh, why don't you just go ahead and grab this right here? And he lifted up my shirt and I had the gun right there. I mean. It was totally up to me what I did with that gun. I chose not to use it. But when they saw, I mean, I could see the expression in their face. It was just, they were sick. I carried a knife in my ass for six months so that the first chance I got, I could stab somebody, okay? That's how serious I took what I was doing. And even if that's just what he's saying is a 2% factor in reality, this might be the 2% factor you'll be confronted with. When we stab somebody in here, we're doing it with somebody pointing a rifle at us. You know, it's, every time I've stabbed somebody in prison, it's been right under a gun tower with a guy holding a Mini-14. Mm -hmm. Knowing damn well when I went to go stab the guy that that dude up there was gonna try to shoot me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you, you become, and once you start dealing with those situations, dealing with a cop, I mean, the difference between us and your average criminal is they don't have that edge. They don't have the ability to pull the trigger. They don't have the, the ability to act aggressively on a spurs moment. Just a, the thought arrives and you act on it. We don't and teach these guys in here to take you for granted as police no, officers. No, definitely not. And, and, and your academy it shouldn't be teaching right. them to take us for granted right. because, like he's saying, you know, these people are coming out here, they're playing for keeps, just like you're playing for keeps so you can go home every night. You know, one of the main things, like like I said, we're involved in bank robbers and so forth. Well, we'll do a 30, 60 day observation out there on a certain area that we want to hit. And now with the cops, every so often they'll pass by a certain bank. You know what I'm saying? And we know this because of past experiences. So we keep track, okay, when the cops come around, okay, where they go to have their lunch break. Because usually guys, you guys have a, a certain place where you guys go eat. You know what I'm saying? Okay, that's where they're at. You know what I mean? Okay, they should be coming time by any moment. So we keep track of that as well. So that way, whenever we're, the bank robbery has to go down, okay, this is how much time we have before they come cruising by. You know what I'm saying? So we keep track of all that. You know, observation is one of our main keys. Uh, one time, um, we had an officer that was harassing uh, some apartment complexes that I uh, took care of business in when I was involved in selling drugs and stuff. And uh, he was like real aggressive, you know, to kind of do the hands-on, beat you up kind of do, and uh, what we call an oppressive pig, you know? <laughs> But uh, so what winds up happening, uh, he kept on kept, he kept on coming in, checking this one vacant apartment. That was his excuse to come fuck with everybody, come mess with everybody. So one day, uh, me and a friend of mine, uh, we went inside the apartment and waited for him to come because we knew he would come. And uh, I had a, a fully automatic, a MAC-10, and my friend had a Tech-9. And uh, the idea was, being that he had a partner, was uh, he's gonna come check the door my friend busts on him through the door and I would shoot at his partner through the window because the design of the apartment the way it was, we'd have had him pinned down. Uh, just so happens they, uh, uh, they were called to another call or something. He didn't come down the terrace and uh, he went on about his business. He made it, he escaped. But that's what I was saying. Uh, we knew by his routine, he would use that to come fuck with somebody and we waited for him but also studying the way that they operate in tactical uh, uh, moves. When they do a prison hit, they rehearse it. You know, there's often a person that's a lookout. There's a person who's going to actually make the hit. There's a backup unit. There's a person who, who creates a diversion. There's people who deliver the weapons. There's people who take the weapons out of, out of view. There's an armor, you know, and, they, and the tacticians who plan these moves. So the more familiar you are, you are with that kind of a situation, the more it's going to help you. Not just in the, in the environment of custody, but when you go to the street, a 211 team is made up just like a prison hit team. In a joint force 
task force of this county, that county, this city, this city, CDC, FBI, mm -hmm. goes out to take these gang members down in these neighborhoods and uh, when they file their reports, one guy might not black it out, this guy might put this, get, this guy puts that, that guy puts this. So now all these gang members in the shoe have all the identities of your undercover narc cars, detective cars, your beeper numbers, your names, what car you drove at the time of the incident. Because one faction don't know what the other faction is doing when they file their reports. So all that information is passed down to the Board of Prison Terms and they gotta supply the prisoner with a copy of his violation report from all these agencies. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Your badge numbers too are all in there. Your badge yeah, numbers on all our reports. I mean, when you yeah. put your badge number on it, that's basically like putting your ID card on it. Because, yeah. I mean, we under the, the premise of something else, we can call the police station and we can re decide that we want to file a report against you or a complaint. Mm -hmm. And then once we file this false complaint, we, you know, we use your badge number, we file the complaint, and from there we can find out what doors we need to open to find out more information about you. So when you think you got a beat on this guy, he knows you're following him. He knows what you're driving. That's a cop right there. So he's going to take you off on a little trip, you know what I mean? Stop here, stop there, contact this dude. You never know what's going to happen. You know what I mean? He might take you down an alley, and when you drive through the alley, there's dudes standing right there with semi-automatic rifles and just blast you. And he just keeps driving. You're going to hit a garage, you're dead. You know what I mean? The organization's taking a different approach, and... We're not allowing members now to get any tattoos, you know, especially where they're visible, you know. Um, don't dress up all bagged up, you know. If you have to wear some tight jeans, wear some tight jeans. Look like your average Joe out there. Um, get yourself a job, go to school. You know, if you're working during the day, then you're committing crime at night. You know, if you're working at night, then you're gonna be committing crimes in, in the day. But basically what we try to do now is have them change their appearance, you know, have them change the way they talk, you know, because, um, if you notice, there's a difference. If you get a gang member from the streets and you get someone off the shoe, you're going to see their vocabulary is a lot different. One's going to sound more educated than the other. Now, if you can go out there with his appearance altered, looking different, blending in with people, but as well as his, his dialogue, his conversation, well, then more than likely people ain't going to really focus on him because he's blending in with society. If he walks up to me and he has an air of confidence, I don't care how he looks, I'm going to deal with him accordingly. I'm going to know that this dude, maybe he's not in the greatest shape, but he's got that air of confidence about him. You know, he's looking at me in my eyes when he's talking to me. He's not, you know, trying to be overly friendly, so I'm gonna deal with it. Number two, I'm gonna look at his physical shape, the shape he's in physically. You know, is, is he dumpy? Does he look soft? Um, does he look like he stays in shape? Because if he takes care of his body, chances are he takes care of his mind as well. You know, they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And if he's taking care of those things, he's gonna be difficult for me to deal with. And then beyond that, I'm just gonna have to pick and choose, you know? I'm gonna look at Possibly the fact of, you know, how old does he look? Does he look like he's been on the force for a long time? And also the, the factor of being male or female is going to come into play too. How so? Because, I mean, this, I mean, this sounds really vicious right here, man, but uh, I don't, maybe it's just me, but I, ain't no woman going to whoop me. That's the bottom line. I mean, she, and that's it. And, I, and if I see a female officer, I'm gonna feel more confident having to deal with her than I would with a but man. When they go out of their way to make you feel uncomfortable and little knee in the head or something, then you wanna just turn around and start getting off. And Target you as a person instead of just doing their job. Right. I think a lot of officers basically that sometimes they'll let the job get to their head. Right. Well, they think they're above the law. But if you pull me out of a car and wanna gaffle me up and grab my nuts and just, you know, pretty much put me out there on, on the highway to be looked at, I'm gonna get angry, you know? Mm -hmm. and what do you mean though when you get, I'm gonna get angry? Well, what because you, I-, I you do I, something then or? Well, hey, you know, it, it wouldn't matter if it's male or female because, right. you know, there's a, there's a common sense of respect there for who I am and who you are. And I feel you violated that by confronting me with no reason, you know? Maybe you have profiling issues or whatever, and you want to jack me up without giving me what I feel is my due respect. Yeah, it's going to get confrontational. An officer on the streets could know this individual from being a street gang member and know that, hey, the guy's not really on the ball. Um, he's just a flunky. He's out here slinging crack. 
he goes to prison, ends up under the umbrage of this organization, comes back out a year and a half later, and now that officer is dealing with somebody completely different. The officer may not know that, but in reality, he's dealing with a completely different person having been educated by your organization. Oh, yeah. Mandatory. You know, um, you know, because we, you know, one thing, one thing about our organization, our thing is education. You know what I mean? And we're going to educate them. You know what I mean? A lot of things, you know, like I said, art of war, art of leadership, you know, concepts, you know, Mexican, Aztec history, business. So they're going out there educated. You know what I'm saying? And um, they're going out there better trained, more physically fit. And they're going out there with the goal because they want to, you know, exceed where the older homeboys are at. They want to be somebody. You know what I'm saying? Um, they're more disciplined. You know what I mean? They're more dedicated. You know, so you're dealing with a whole different person. He's a walking weapon for us. You know what I mean? Whether it be mentally or physically. We look at gangbangers, you know, like I said before, um, well, wandering clouds of shit. You know, they, they're, they have no self-worth in life. They have no goals in life. You know, you get someone coming out of prison like an NF member, well, I got goals and objectives. You know what I mean? Um, whether I got to, you know, bootlick the police officer for five minutes in order to get away, that's what I'm going to do. You know what I'm saying? If, if I got to do some physical harm to the police officer in order for me to get away, that's what I'm going to do. You know, but in dealing with somebody coming out of prison, you got to understand that he's calculating everything. You know what I'm saying? He's being observed. He's being patient. What calls for what? You know what I'm saying? He's using his mind more instead of just reacting to a certain situation. Like you got youngsters out there, you know, so it's a totally different situation. You can find yourself dead or hurt or, hey, going home that night. And a law enforcement official on the street needs to understand many of these guys have been hit with impact rounds four, five, six times. They've been sprayed with pepper spray. They've walked through CN and CS in order to complete their mission. They're not just going to quit because you're telling them to do so or because uh, you've deployed some munition or tool uh, to get them to stop. If I was on a mission and you caught me on the way to do it, um, I would definitely be looking to take your life. I mean, and it would be a quick thing. And, and you know, it wouldn't be about the assessments that I would make of you, it, either way, they aren't going to impede me from doing what I have to do. They're just gonna help me in judging how I'm gonna carry it out. Because if I think that I can just really overpower you physically, I might try to do it quietly. But if I think that I would have problems, then I'm just gonna shoot you. And that's basically what it means. It doesn't mean it's going to happen or it's not going to happen. It's just how it's gonna happen. Um, personally, I, my, my plan had always been really simple. You know, If someone pulled me over, during the commission of a crime, or after having just committed a crime, I would just wait for him to come to my window, and as soon as he stuck his head in there, I would shoot him. And um, it's, that's pretty cut and dry. You know, I wouldn't shoot him from a distance. I would not want to get into a shootout with him because I'm scared of guns. I mean, I don't like bullets coming at me. I mean, if I shoot somebody, I don't want them to be shooting back at me. So I want to basically catch them when they're slipping. If they're in the process of committing a crime, you know, and they know they're gonna get busted. Well, most of the time they'll wait, because I mean, what, I mean, in prison, as well as in the streets, patience is a virtue. So what we do, we always look for that weakness that a police officer commits. You know, one thing that we always found out that a lot of police officers like putting their heads down when they like to write, or they like to get too little close, you know, not really pay attention to the individual, because a lot of police officers, they wanna exert their authority. They think just because they're in blue or they have a badge, I'm the man here, you know, I'm more superior than you. He ain't gonna do nothing to me. I'm, you know, I'm badass. But they fail to realize that a lot of individuals coming out now, well, they're gonna take these opportunities. You know, they catch your head, catch you looking down while you're writing. You catch, you know, you're up too close, whatever. They're gonna take one. They're gonna try to take you. You know, I'm saying in order to get out of there. And nine times out of ten, if there's more than one person in that car going to do a target, you you're, know, you're washed up. You better get back up before you even approach that. I don't know what yeah, you're first. Because if I'm with him. I already know what he's going to do. He's got two strikes. He ain't going back to prison. And we ain't leaving our partner he, behind. I mean, we take into consideration the fact that when you make initial contact with us, mm -hmm. it's going to be a one-on-one -on -one situation. And we're going to have the advantage because we know what you're bringing when you're walking up to us. You're bringing your gun. You're bringing your radio. And if you're alone, if you don't have a partner, that's all you're bringing. You have no idea what I have waiting for you in my car, in my waistband. You're basically walking up onto the situation cold. And at that moment in time, I have an advantage over you. This is something that we talked about a lot. And that's where the aggressiveness comes into play. You know, 
if I take aggressive steps then, when, it's, when I have the advantage, chances are I'm gonna win. If I wait until you have a chance to make your call and backup arrives, I'm gonna get caught because there's no way I can deal with the whole police force. Put it this way, it's either your life or the law enforcement's life. So if he's coming in between your mission or your objective, even as he, even if he's just pulling you over and you haven't completed your task yet, you're gonna come back here and you're gonna have reprisals against you. And if you can't clean that up some way, then it's your life in danger. And that's the way people look at it. So of course their objective is gonna be whether they're pulled over, it's gonna be, you know, if they got a gun, they're gonna use it, you know, because otherwise it's their life that's in danger coming back here without completing their mission. While you are at Pelican Bay, um, you were involved with Raul Leon? Amongst other Mexican Mafia members, yeah. Mainly him, because he's from my neighborhood. Can you detail the elaborate escape plot and how it was going to impact local law enforcement in Crescent City? We were going to get these guys that were getting ready to parole to come back up here and break some of us out. Uh, it was being financed by a guy named Bat Marquez. He was involved with the Ariano cartel. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with him. He was gonna supply the money, the weapons, and the safe route out down, down to Mexico. We did several, I myself did three dry runs. I ingested some crystal meth while I was in the shoe and complained of chest pains. When I was taken out to, uh, to see the doctor. My heartbeat was obviously racing from the methamphetamine I had ingested and it took me out. My mission was to count how many guards were with me, how many guns I counted, little guns, how many guns, guns they were carrying, the route that we took. And it was scarily simple the way this was done. It was, I counted at most three guards with me and four guns. So there was a person on the outside coming up to visit that did his dry runs from his end yes. that was gonna facilitate the gang members when they actually came up. Uh, yes, yes, and just to scope out how the hospital was, possible getaway routes, uh, all that. You guys were gonna be waiting at Sutter Coast where the ambulance showed up. You know it's a CDC a transport because you have a CDC car behind them. As soon as, it, as, soon as the CDC staff gets out, they were supposed to kill all the CEOs that, that were escorting them, kill everybody around, break, put him in a van and drive him out. From San Diego to Crescent City, had they been stopped, they would have shot. They would have shot. They would have shot instantly. They would have shot immediately. You had a gun, running gun battle with those officers. Because they know once you ex accept a mission like that, you don't want to sit in the county jail in LA or wherever you got stopped and, and writing a letter to Pelican Bay say, oops, we're sorry, we got pulled over. Because then these guys would be in the hat. I mean, they, had, they, they would get killed. They would be marked for assault. And some of those guys have paroled from Pelican Bay that you're aware of? Yes. Yes, three that I know of right now. This plan is still, to your knowledge. Hey, no, nothing's changed, nothing's changed. You guys have done a pretty good job at isolating this guy and cutting off some of his communication. But as far as I know, the last time I was at the bay, the last thing we heard, this plan was still in motion. This plan was still, as of right now, is still in motion. Pomoda? Right. Pomoda, it, that, in my opinion, it was a big mistake. Look, look, look at what happened, look at what happened. They just went into the neighborhood and started picking everybody up. They, I mean, I can tell you if I was back at Pelican Bay, still active, a lot of brothers would, would be very, very upset at what happened, what took place. And, and they, unless it was a specific hit, which I don't think it was, they would be very upset because they just went in and raided all their houses. They lost all that money. They lost all those soldiers in the streets because this one, one youngster got crazy and went and killed a cop. I wouldn't be surprised if this youngster gets stabbed in the institution pretty soon. Why? They be, because he brought all this heat up on all these guys because he went out there and got crazy and shot a cop for no reason, for no apparent reason. What about the situation in Oceanside where the word was out that the, the mafia sanctioned assaults on police officers? Oh, I've been a part of that too. I, I mean, it, it, like I said, it happens. It happens when you feel like, and I don't want to use the word justify because it's never justified to go on and assault anybody, especially cops. Uh, but when, they, when the Mexican mafia feels that an example needs to be set that you just cannot allow these cops to just go around pushing you around or shooting one of your own. Yeah, they do sanction hits against cops, but you'll know when it's a sanctioned hit by the Mexican Mafia, by who does it, by the way it's carried out. You'll know when it's a Mexican Mafia hit. But it does happen, it does happen. They tend to stay away from it, but when they feel that they need to do it, oh, they've got no problem sanctioning hits against cops. It just happened in San Diego. 
So the the one in National City that came those orders came out of Pelican Bay. Oh, I came directly from out of Pelican Bay. Yeah, I was a a, a young story, a, a young kid who got shot by a National City police officer, and they felt that it was wrong, so they put out a green light on National City cops. Say we want we want a cop dead by anybody, any cop, and then they sent out word out there say they start shooting cops. Yeah, that came out straight out of Pelican. Do gang members in Pelican Bay shoe or in, in general, do you guys work or practice at sizing people up? Oh yeah, it's uh, it's um, Do you size them up physically? Do you size them up mentally? You size them up every which way. You know, physically, mentally, you try to break them down. You try to break them, even though it's a person that you might not even think, you know, that would do something for you. I mean, it's a, what is it? It's a 115. That's nothing compared to the the outcome if you do get to crack one and and uh, and, and you know get the correctional officer or the free staff working for you. You know, so you know, what do you have to lose? You have nothing to lose. How many times do you recall getting subpoenaed out to court for the sole purpose of conducting Mexican mafia business? Numerous of times. I've subpoenaed people. You've had people subpoenaed so that they would show up at a specific location so you guys could conduct? Yeah, well, I had them subpoenaed from Pelican Bay here to go down to Sacramento when we were fighting our case. And uh, you would get so many members and members from the AB, a few blacks, and uh, maybe one victim that we're going to go after. And you'd subpoena the victim as well? Yeah. If, if he wasn't already where you were at? Yeah. Yeah. Los, Los Angeles was always one of the spots, hot now, spots for that we used to get subpoenaed yeah. down there, go down there for specific reasons to conduct Mexican mafia activity. And so that that's part of your networking tool. Yes. Do gang members do they sometimes maybe partake in um, prison crime specifically so they can get court appearances? Well, they want to stay in uh, the county jail. They say, pull me down, let me catch a case so I can be down there for a while. Because that's where all the drugs are at, mm -hmm. uh, quick visits, and it, it breaks up time. You know, right. Instead of being in the same joint for a long time. Right. So that's that's a place to go, down the court. What's gonna happen when, say, Epi was still in the organization, and you go back to a county jail, and nothing's really happening, what should long, the deputies in that jail expect is gonna happen, either while you're there or after you've left? No, they're going to expect a lot of change. You know, I mean, they're going to, you know, they're going to see a lot of difference. You know, you're going to see people, you know, um, you know, educating, exercising. You know, things are going to be more quiet. But now, just because we're cool and everything, doesn't mean that we're not doing what we have to. You know, we're going to be, you know, teaching weaponry. You know, we're going to f try to find ways to get drugs in, how to get drugs out, how to put hits down. You know, and this is what's going to take place. You know, but we train our people to stay away from the light of you guys. So that way, CEOs don't focus on us because the less heat comes on us, the more we're capable of carrying out our activities. You know, so, and then like, say if I got there, I, I would set up a chain, you know, chain of command. You know, I'd be up here, I'd have one person below me, another person be below him, and then you'd have your soldiers, depending on the manpower that you got there. You know, now if I happen to leave, well, there's somebody there who's gonna step up to my spot. So you got reserve commanders. You know, so that way, the unity and the activities going on there stays intact. You know, so that way, when these individuals happen to come up to prison, they pretty much know what to expect when they come up here. You know, because they've already been having a, they've had a taste for it. Well, let me ask you, if you're at Pelican Bay and for whatever reason you get subpoenaed to go out to court to a county facility, is there status uh, attached to coming out of Pelican Bay, either the GP or the Pelican Bay Shield? Oh, quite naturally, like down there where I'm out of, I'm out of LA County Jail, and they have a high power section in our jail. And um, when I went back out to court, uh, you know, there was Nazi lower riders. And then they say if the Aryan Brotherhood member comes down out to court, whichever white man has the tier tender job at the time, which is, you know, he gets three hours out in the tier to use the phone and all that stuff just to sweep and clean for five minutes. But he gets that phone for three hours and, and run the tier and do what he wants. That, that status is automatically his plus. Uh, you know, he picks up automatically um, the keys per se um, to the house. You know, I'm saying it's like you know, he's the he's the management, the landlord. You know, the police are not the the landlord. The the dictator is the Aryan Brotherhood or the Nazi lowriders or whoever is sanctioned by the brand or one of those prison gangs 
to, you know, sanctioned who runs the house if one of them aren't there, and that's who you'd have to adhere to. You don't listen to the police. You guys have been patted down probably thousands of times since you've been in custody. How often in, the, in all those times as a, a police officer, correctional officer, really checked in and around your groin to see if you've concealed something? Should I've had him raise it and didn't even notice. It was always something right there. Like out here on the out here on the main line, what some of us would do would we tight something on the penis itself. You know what I'm saying? Because knowing that the cops not going to touch. Yeah, they ain't going to just grab you. So it'd be right there. I mean, they they would hit the underside of it. Like when they come up, they hit the underside. All right, no problem. You know. But there's a lot of times too. Like you guys don't run. You guys hand up people's cracks. You know what I mean? So there's times that we just chick a piece, mm -hmm. meaning that we have the piece just between our butt cheeks, and we'll just keep it secured there. Because we're like this, you can secure something, have your legs open, and won't fall out. And all you guys are doing is just this. I could just in be in between the cheeks, or it could be you know tied onto the to the penis. The Mexican mafia today is in the position that the Sicilian mafia would have been in 1920 in New York or 1930 in Chicago. Uh, many people look at them as being thugs, but these thugs are becoming more and more sophisticated, and eventually. Uh, their sophistication uh, level will reach the point that they'll be the, uh, the mafia of Los Angeles. Instead of the five families, you might have the five gangs uh, controlled each by a charismatic leader of the Mexican mafia if we, if we came to that. And the whole idea is that we are going to be proactive, which we always talk about in law enforcement, we sometimes don't do, and stop that from happening before we become, you know, like New York or like Chicago.